A warning shot has been fired at Bill Belichick publicly, and this is as close as we have ever been during this Belichick Patriots tenure of the head coach and GM being on the precipice of being let go. Robert Kraft, I believe, has sent a warning shot to Bill Belichick today via Jeff Howe in The Athletic. Here's what Howe wrote today. There's a school of thought that suggests Bill Belichick has earned the right to go out on his own accord, that the architect of the greatest dynasty in NFL history can coach in New England as long as he chooses. Kraft doesn't subscribe to it. On multiple occasions in recent years, Kraft has lamented the team's lack of a postseason victory in the post-Brady era. Not too surprising, right? But then there is the line that, that really counts. Here's the line that jumps out. Kraft has grown frustrated if not downright angry, angry over this shortage of success, according to people close to the situation. Kraft loved Belichick's savviness and organization with the salary cap as it related to roster construction. Belichick was an incredible forward thinker during a time when many teams were still struggling to navigate the relatively new cap system. But Belichick has failed to evolve. Now, I don't know if Robert Kraft is the one who spoke to Jeff Howe. I find that to be unlikely, but somebody close to Kraft, somebody within this organization, someone that understands how Kraft feels and what he's been thinking, spoke to Jeff Howe, maybe multiple people. And whoever, whoever spoke to Jeff Howe, whoever it was and how many of them spoke to him, the message was clear. Bill, you're in trouble. You have been put on notice, my friend. Howe continues to write, Kraft loved Belichick's savviness in organization, again, failed to evolve. The Patriots under Belichick's watch have also struggled to draft and develop talent. Punter Jake Bailey, a 2019 fifth-round pick, was the last in-house selection to get a multi-year contract extension, and he was cut seven months later. Four other players got similar extensions in the previous four seasons, all of them fourth- or fifth-round selections. Meanwhile, Howe writes, Contenders like the Chiefs, 49ers, and Eagles are consistently paying to keep their homegrown talent. On the sideline, NFL observers were dumbfounded by the lack of a succession plan when then-offensive coordinator Josh McDaniels departed in 2022. These are things we've talked about. The idea that there was no succession plan once McDaniels left and you moved to Matt Patricia and Joe Judge. And really the news here is not only were we dumbfounded, not only were we looking at that scratching our heads, NFL observers were as well. Now, that's a very vague description of who we're talking about here. But people within the league looked at Belichick and his decision-making regarding McDaniel's departure as he went to Vegas and questioned, what the hell is going on? What? How does he not have a plan that's better than that? Finally, Jeff Howe writes in The Athletic today, based on their lack of execution in the last five games, there's little evidence to suggest a marked turnaround is imminent. And Kraft has long since gotten sick of watching other teams' highlights on his new scoreboard. Again, RKK or someone close to the owner is officially putting Bill Belichick on notice as of today, October 11th, 2023. If you thought it might happen just a day ago, oh, it has happened today. The talking has begun. And this is a clear shot across the bow. This is a clear message to Belichick. Now that you sit at one and four, outscored 72 to three in the last two games, including 34 to Zippo at home, with thousands of people leaving your home stadium at halftime. This is a clear message, a clear shot across the bow to the GM and head coach of this football team. And the message is win or you're going to see significant change, Bill. Win or you could be completely out. The message has been sent. Now, I think this is obviously an early jump on public relations by the ownership. Whoever spoke to Jeff Howe wanted to get this out as early as possible. They did not want this to linger over the next few weeks. Let's not forget, this is a team after this weekend that plays the Raiders. 
that has to play Buffalo and then has to go down to Miami to play the Dolphins. And ownership knows that. Ownership knows the schedule. Ownership's trying to get ahead of this. So whoever spoke to Jeff Howe, this is getting the message out, not only to Belichick, but it's getting the message out to the fan base. We hear you. We see you. We saw you leave the stadium. We know how angry you are. And we are as angry as you are at this point. This is to tell the fan base, we understand. Now, whether or not you believe the ownership does truly understand this, or this is just lip service, because we've heard the past couple of off seasons, Kraft put Belichick's feet to the fire. Whether you believe it or not, that's up to you. All I'm saying is the fact that ownership, whoever close to ownership spoke with Jeff Howe, whoever's having these conversations behind the closed doors, over the telephones, via text, whoever is having these conversations with Howe is telling Belichick, telling the fan base, this ain't it. This is not nearly good enough, and we're close to being done. And this operation, we know, is a mess right now. The message is clear. Prepare for the worst. If you are a fan, prepare for the worst. If you are a fan, prepare for Belichick to be gone. Understand that we understand the problems that are at hand. That's what this is about. This kind of story comes out. This is earth-shaking to a point, and that's not hyperbolic. I mean, this is somebody that's close enough to craft, if not multiple people close to craft, putting it out there. People close to the situation is how is how uh, he he wrote it, right? How how wrote it? It's kind of weird. How Jeff How wrote that? People close to the situation. People multiple, not a source. Multiple people close to the situation saying, oh, yeah, RKK is pissed. He knows this thing is a debacle right now. So prepare for it. Prepare for the worst. And and I said, it's earth shaking, earth rattling, whatever you want to say. Because when's the last time we had this up to this point? This is this is clear. This is as clear as you can get. This is throwing haymakers at Bill Belichick. Your personnel decisions have sucked. Your cap management has sucked. Your plan after Josh McDaniels sucked. This is calling Belichick out. The firing squad is out. We've never seen this since he's been here in New England. Feels like a point of no return. You either turn it around or we're going to have to say goodbye. I also found it interesting that almost all of the criticism within this story had to do with Belichick's personnel decisions. What does that say? Does that tell us that there could be an option where Belichick stays as the coach but has to give up the say on personnel? Is that opening the door to that decision down the road? There's no mention of Belichick's fourth down decisions. There's no Belichick in coaching strategy criticisms. There's really none of that. 95% of this story, because some has to do with Mac, which we'll get to in a little bit, along with the Bruins opener, which we will discuss as well. That's happening tonight. But this is 95% an indictment on Belichick as GM. And I wonder, reading this, is that the biggest issue that Kraft and company have? Do they look at Bill and believe that Bill can still be a good head coach, if not really good head coach, but they look at the decisions that he has made as the shot caller, and they understand that the talent is not good enough. This roster is not good enough. Because they're calling Bill out for those things. Not coaching stuff, for the most part. Could this be a tell? Could this be a tell that Kraft and others within his circle are getting ready to remove Belichick from the GM title and that they're getting Bill prepared for it? You know, this is a really good way. If you're Kraft, this is a really smart way 
to send the warning out to Bill and say, hey, look, this is not working. You've made a number of bad decisions personnel-wise, and you best prepare to lose that control. And people might say, Nick, they don't have that conversation in person. I don't know, and I don't believe Kraft would sit down during the season and have this conversation with Belichick. Kraft is a very patient guy. He doesn't like to get in the way of the operation. I think Kraft wants to let this play out. The owner wants to see how ugly this can get. So I don't think Kraft would have this conversation in season. He's going to let Belichick try to figure things out on the football side. He's going to try to allow Belichick to right the ship if he can. I don't think Kraft, he's never been the guy that goes stomping down and, and banging on the door. Now, there was the Brady Garoppolo thing, but that was the level of urgency was different. A decision had to be made with Jimmy G to poop or get off the pot. That, that was a different scenario. This scenario, there's urgency to turn the season around, but big picture wise, there's no urgency to do anything in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. So I believe Kraft is willing to let this play out, but this is the warning to Belichick. Prepare yourself, Bill, because we see where you've screwed up, and to us it's unacceptable. This could be a tell of how Kraft is thinking regarding Belichick's future. I also found it interesting that there was questioning of how the money has been spent because people have pushed back on Robert Kraft, and there's been a lot of conversation, and it's fair conversation to have about the cash spending numbers. And there's zero doubt in my mind that this is pushback from those that are close to Kraft, if not Kraft himself. This is pushback on that discussion, the cash spending discussion. This is to say, hey, look, he hasn't drafted well enough. And because he hasn't drafted well enough, we haven't been able to sign guys to extensions because he's wasted a bunch of picks. And the decisions that he has made with the money that he has have been bad decisions. And I get the cash spending should be higher. The cash spending has been at the bottom of the league. I see the numbers like you see the numbers. I understand. But the fact is, you could have had Jacoby Myers on a very affordable contract. You decided, as Bill Belichick, to go out and give Juju Smith-Schuster the contract you gave him. You could have had Jacoby here in New England for the money, pretty much, that you gave Juju. That's not a cash spending issue. That is a decision. That is an evaluation issue of the players involved. So the cash spending only goes so far. You know, it's like when you're growing up, if your parents give you five bucks, they're going to give you five bucks. That's what you've got to spend. Make the most of it. Belichick has not made the most of the five dollars he's been given. So there's no doubt that this is a counterpunch to those conversations about the cash spending. This is somebody in Kraft Circle, multiple people, maybe even Kraft himself, who knows? Whoever spoke with Jeff Howe, this is their way to push back on that and say, cash spending ain't the issue. It's not the money we're spending. It's how we're spending the money. It's who we're spending the money on. My question after reading this is, will Bill Belichick's side respond? Would you not anticipate that? If you're Belichick and you wake up today and you're staring at a one and four record and you're heading to Las Vegas with your team in a couple of days and you're trying to figure things out and you wake up and you read this, Belichick, Belichick might look at this as a hit piece, frankly. I think it's a justified hit piece, by the way. I think it's a justified criticism of his record and something had to be said publicly after what we've witnessed the last two weeks. You can't allow people to believe that this is a rudderless ship from the very tippity top. But from Belichick's point of view, he might be looking at this and saying, excuse me? Hit piece. Will Belichick's side respond to this? You have to believe something is going to be said over the next couple of weeks. You have to believe that somebody close to Belichick is going to come out and try to stand up for the coach. It's been a rough couple of weeks for Belichick. The on-field product, the local media questioning him, Julian Edelman coming out and questioning him publicly about the offensive decisions he's made, highlighting the Jacoby Myers decision. 
And now you have this piece from Jeff Howell in The Athletic where people close to Kraft are throwing Belichick under the bus. I don't think the coach and GM is going to respond very well to that, especially behind the scenes. And if things don't turn around, this could get ugly. This could be slinging mud from one side to the other. The first sling is from ownership. The, the first mud that has been thrown is from Robert Kraft or somebody close to Kraft, people close to Kraft. Now will the head coach, GM, sling mud back? Will this get even more contentious? Something to keep an eye on. RKK isn't the only one that has had issues with Belichick the last few years. We'll have more on that in a moment. Another very interesting tidbit from Jeff Howe's piece today we'll get to. But first, I want to remind you that two weeks from tonight, October 25th, that Wednesday night will be opening night for the Boston Celtics at Madison Square Garden against the New York Knicks. And I will be doing a live Celtics postgame podcast. Cattles on Causeway, the Celtics pod that I do, comes out every Wednesday. We will have an episode of that coming up today. We will also have another episode for you next Wednesday, and then we will follow that up. Two weeks. Mark your calendars if you're a Celtics fan. We will react to that game, to the opening night game at Madison Square Garden, live. YouTube, I'll have it on X, and you can jump on YouTube, and we can go back and forth, and we can react to what happens that night. But two weeks from tonight, a live post-game podcast by yours truly, breaking down Celtics Knicks, Wednesday, October 25th. I also remind you to rate, review, like, and subscribe. I can't say enough about all of you who have been listening and watching this program. The first two days of this week, the biggest numbers we've ever seen. Monday, the biggest numbers we've had. Eclipsed yesterday by the biggest numbers we've had. And it's all because of you. I can't thank you enough. This is a one-man band. I don't have any help, no backing. This is just me. So what helps me the most, those comments, the thumbs up. If you can take a second and give me that thumbs up, if you're watching on YouTube right now, it would mean the world to me. We had 1,400 plus views. Yesterday's video as of this morning, 160 likes. More of you have to like what we're doing here, right? I hope so. Give me that thumbs up and subscribe. All right, let's get to another nugget from Howe's Story. That stuck out to me like a sore thumb, and it had to do with Mac Jones. Here's what uh, Howe wrote about Mac and Belichick. Belichick alienated Jones last season. Alienated. Isolated the quarterback. Pushed away from him. Belichick alienated Jones last season. A truth so obvious around the Patriots building. Get this. That Kraft became aware and had to take the temperature of the situation. Now, you remember what I just said a couple of minutes ago about Kraft not like uh, not likely to get involved in things very often, especially during the season. He's not Jerry Jones. He's not that type of owner. He usually allows Belichick to handle the organization, again, aside from the Brady and Garoppolo thing, and you certainly understand that. You're dealing with the greatest of all time. But this relationship, the alienation as it is deemed in Howe's story today, the alienation by Belichick towards the quarterback got so uncomfortable last year that the owner had to step in and have a conversation. That's not good. It got so bad between your quarterback and the head coach that the owner got involved. And again, whoever spoke with Jeff Howe is laying that at the feet of Belichick and not Mac Jones. The wording is very important here. There's a reason why this sentence was framed the way it was framed. Jeff's good at what he does. And, and I'll go back to it. This is how the sentence was structured. Belichick alienated Jones last season. Not Jones alienated Belichick. Not Jones gave Belichick a tough time. Not Mac did this, Mac did that. Belichick alienated Jones. That is handing the responsibility of the rough relationship, handing that responsibility to the coach and not the player. Find that interesting. 
There's a reason for everything. How continues it rattled Jones's confidence last season, among other issues with the offense, and it's reasonable to wonder how much it hindered his play this season, questioning whether any given mistake could shorten his leash or cut it entirely. Whoever Howe spoke to is laying the blame for Mac's deterioration on Bill Belichick. There's no denying Mac is broken right now. We talked about it the first two pods this week. You have a broken quarterback in New England right now. The last two weeks have been bad. If you read this piece, I just read you the excerpt. If, if you're reading or, or just listening to me share the excerpts with you, again, the message is clear. Yet the quarterback was done wrong by his head coach. That's the story. That's the narrative that whoever spoke with Jeff Howe is pushing in this story. No doubt about it. They're laying most of Mac's deterioration at the feet of Belichick. And I don't disagree. And I know some of you, many of you do disagree. And, and you blame Mac. You, that's your opinion. You can do what you want to do. You can fan the way you want to fan. But as I've said, blame pie, I give the vast majority of the blame pie to Belichick. The lack of support, the lack of development, the coaching staff, the on-field talent, the offensive line. And whoever spoke with Howe agrees with me and leans on my side. Now, there is some part of this that you have to question. Was Belichick the one that made the decision to draft Mac? Already in his second year, the head coach is alienating his quarterback. Not my words, the story's words. So was Mac ever Belichick's guy? And if not, who made the pick? If Kraft made the pick, if Kraft wanted Mac to be that pick, then you could certainly read this story and say, well, this is ownership protecting that decision to draft Mac Jones. If ownership had pushed Belichick to make that pick, this is their way to say, we still think the pick was good. Not our fault he screwed it up. That is also part of this. You start to see the fingers pointing. Not good. Not good at all. I wonder, does Belichick blame the offensive shortcomings on the quarterback? Why did Belichick alienate Jones if that is true? Did Belichick alienate Jones because Jones rubbed Belichick the wrong way? Was it Max emotions? Was it his attitude that we've seen at times? Is that what gave Belichick an indication as to this guy isn't the guy? I don't necessarily love him. And, and, and caused the coach to alienate from the quarterback? Why was there this alienation as it's been deemed? Why? And does Belichick look at Mac Jones and blame Mac? for all of the things that have gone wrong. Does Belichick look at himself in the mirror and hold himself accountable for the shortcomings? Or he alienated this quarterback last year, doesn't believe in the quarterback, so inevitably, when things don't go well offensively, he's not looking at himself. He's not looking at Bill O'Brien. He's looking at Mac Jones and saying, this guy wasn't the guy from the beginning. If he is... That's not good because Belichick has to watch Jacoby Myers and say, I screwed that up. He has to look at the right tackle position and say, maybe I could have done more. Did Belichick look at Mac Jones and treat Mac as a prove it to me versus I'm going to help you kind of situation? Quarterback, prove it. Or do I help it? Was Belichick in the mode of prove it? Because I don't believe you. And I, I mentioned that Mac is emotional. There's no doubt Mac's emotional. Did, did Belichick understand that? Did he understand the player he was getting? Did he truly understand the player that he drafted? 
Because even if it was Kraft's call or somebody else's call, you still have a ton of information on the player. And let's not forget, Mac played for Nick Saban. Belichick's BFF. And I don't know, and, and this is not to excuse Mac's emotional state and some of the things that he has done and some of the things he's handled wrong because he has handled things wrong a number of times since being the quarterback here. But your job as the head coach is to manage the player. Your job as the head coach is to understand who the player is. Your job as the head coach is to, hey, I've got maybe a guy who's a little emotional and I got to give him a little bit more TLC than I would give anybody else. And judging from this story, Belichick did not give Mac the TLC last year. He actually alienated the quarterback. In 2023, as a head coach or a manager, you have to manage personalities more than ever. And whether you like it or not as a fan, and whether I like it or not as a pundit, that's how it is. And you could look at it as coddling athletes. It doesn't matter how you feel or I feel. This is how the world works now. And you have to adjust. You have to evolve. And if you have a quarterback that's emotional, if you have a quarterback that might be doubting himself at times, you should bring that quarterback in and embrace that quarterback and support that quarterback. Support that quarterback emotionally and support him on the field as well. And did Belichick not understand that Mac was this emotional? And did he mishandle the emotions last year? Which might have driven a stake between the relationship. And that's the responsibility of the manager. It's just like any employer for an employee. You don't handle every employee the same way. You don't handle every player the same way. And I'll just say a couple more things here. No matter how you feel about Mac Jones, again, he's been broken the last two weeks. And I've never been somebody who has told you that Mac's special. I've never told you that Mac could be elite. I've never even told you that Mac could be a top 10 quarterback. I'm not even sure you can win a Super Bowl with Mac Jones. I've never said any of those things. Others have. I haven't. So don't blame me for what others have said or what's been written by other people. My personal opinion. I, I've, I've never told you that Mac is a special talent. I've told you exactly who I think he is. He is a system quarterback. He doesn't have a very strong arm, doesn't have a strong arm. He's not athletically gifted. He's the type of quarterback that needs a system slash scheme receivers that can be yak machines after he throws it to them, a running game that can supplement the passing game and an offensive line that can keep him upright at a competent level. That's just who he is. Now, the last two weeks, he's not even that he's broken. But no matter how you feel about Mac, whether you feel about him like I just said, or you hate Mac Jones or what, take your personal feelings out of the thought process. Don't think about how you feel about Mac Jones. Look at this as objectively as you can. If you have vitriol for Mac Jones, if you hate him with the heat of a thousand burning suns, okay, that's, that's your call. But I ask you, for just this conversation, to remove those feelings. If you think Mac is great, remove those feelings. If you think Mac is above average when he's set up right, like I do, remove those feelings and just look at this on the base. No matter how you feel about Mac Jones, Bill Belichick has a job to do. And Bill Belichick's job, as he would tell everybody else, do your job. Do your job. Belichick's job, no matter if he loves, likes, or hates the quarterback, is to put that quarterback in a position to succeed. And I don't know how anybody can look at how Mac's been handled the last 18 months and say that he has been put in a position to succeed. Whether you love, hate, or like the guy. You could be indifferent. Belichick has a job to do. Belichick's job was to take this young QB1, support him, and develop him. 
And everything that Belichick has done has been antithetical to that. Don't even include Mac. Just think about it. Belichick has not made one move the last two off seasons. He has not made one singular move in the name of making the quarterback better. Hasn't brought in a legit number one receiver. Has allowed the offensive line to crumble around him. Remove the quarterback and just look at Bill's job and what he's done. He has not fulfilled the responsibility of that job. Period. End of sentence. Also, no matter how you feel about Mac Jones, put yourself in his shoes for a minute. Just put yourself in that situation. You're coming off of a rookie season that was promising. You were solid. You were named one of the best 100 players in the NFL in your rookie year. Things were looking up. You lose Josh McDaniels. You're told that the plan is to go to Matt, Patricia, and Joe Judge. The offensive line starts to deteriorate. Your weapons are not even weapons. The one guy that you could trust, Jacoby Myers. Belichick allows him to walk to Vegas in the offseason and brings in a guy who is not healthy. Think about that. You don't think, if, if you're Mac Jones, you don't think that the coach likes you to the point where people that were witnessing that relationship thought the coach alienated you to the point where the, where the owner had to step in and have a conversation. So you're Mac. The coach doesn't believe in you. The offensive coordinator position has been all over the place. Three offensive coordinators in three years. You have no run game to help you. You can't trust the offensive line. The wide receivers are running bad routes. Check out Evan Lazar and Taylor Kyles and Greg Bedard and Phil Perry and Mike Giardi. They will all agree. Wide receivers aren't running great routes. Again, this is not to excuse Mac the last two weeks. I am just telling you. I put myself in Mac's shoes and I look around. Who do you trust? There's nobody to trust. You can't trust the coach. You can't trust the offensive line. You can't trust the run game. The one guy you could trust on this offense is now in Vegas. And the guy who replaced him has stunk. And we wonder why Mac doesn't trust things that he, he sees out there. We wonder why he doesn't trust the protection. We wonder why he's making these decisions. Not every decision is because of that. But put yourself in his shoes. Imagine if just at your job, imagine if you were working a job and there was nobody that you worked for or worked with that you could trust. How would that feel? And it's not an excuse for Max emotional outbursts and some of the things that he has done. Because he should still be better at that. But I also understand he is a human. And I think any human being surrounded by things that they don't trust will start to act a little bit differently. Will perform differently. A couple of other quick notes before we get to the Bruins opener. Tyquan Thornton back at practice yesterday. That's good news. They're going to need him. Mike Owenu walked through the locker room, according to Mike Reese, so it seems like he might be okay, and it might have been out of an abundance of caution, quote-unquote, taking him out of the game against the Saints. Juju, Demario Douglas, both not at practice, both in concussion protocol. Usually players do not play the week following a concussion. I don't think we'll see Juju or Demario play in Vegas on Sunday, which opens that door wide. For the aforementioned Thornton, who needs to start to prove that he was worth a second round pick, and Kayshawn Booty. I think you could see both of those guys playing this weekend, and this is an opportunity. They will have an opportunity to make plays if they are active. It's up to them to make those plays. Rate, review, like, and subscribe again. Apple Pods, Spotify, YouTube. Don't forget the comments help. The thumbs up help an awful lot. And also, two weeks from tonight, I will be doing a live Celtics post-game podcast following the season opener at Madison Square Garden against the Knicks. 
Write that down if you're a Celtics fan two weeks from tonight. All right, let's wrap it up and talk some Bruins because the Bruins are back. Yes, they are back. They dropped the puck tonight in a meaningful game. Can't wait, as Bart Scott once said. And just some thoughts about what this season could bring to us as Bruins fans and Bruins pundits and just people that like the game of hockey. Obviously, the big story in the preseason, we've talked about him before, was Matty Patra, and he had made the team. It, it looks like he's going to be on the third line. That's where he's been skating the last couple of mornings. So I, I think we expect him to be on that third line. I wondered if Patra might get the second line center spot and you move Coil back to the third line. But that's not what Coach Montgomery is going to do, at least to start this season. Maybe he thinks it's a little bit too much pressure to put on the rookie to put him in the top six. But when you look at what Patra can do, he's a playmaker. He's got great feel for the game. He's done a very good job, the face-off circle. Um, so, you know, you look at his ability to create for others in his natural feel, and he, he's been doing it against good competition. It's not like he's been playing against the Scrabinis the last few preseason games. He has been challenged by starting legitimate hockey players on top two lines. And he has been able to respond to that and answer the challenge accordingly. And now he's made the team. And they've got nine games to make a decision on Patra. So how does he look? If he looks like he's handling his ish, then he stays on this team. And he should stay on the team. If he looks that way, I do question the size, the wear and tear of, you know, 82 games could absolutely show itself. And Patra is 176 pounds, not a big dude, but it's exciting to have Patra on this roster to start the season. Also, Johnny Beecher, another youngin making the roster. And Beecher is a big dude. He's big. He's physical, 6'3", 215. He has good speed on the ice. Not your prototypical, you know, center for the Bruins. Will that make him an odd fit? We'll have to see. He will be centering the fourth line. So you've got two rookie centers. We were wondering, how in the world do you replace the biggest hole on this roster? The biggest hole on this roster by far. Krejci, Bergeron, gone. How do you fill that? And the Bruins are going to lean on youth. Patra and Beecher will be the third line and fourth line centers, respectively. Lots to put on two young guys. We'll see how they do. We'll see how they respond. The Beecher fourth line, Patra third line. If the center group survives, this team could be fun. And, and I just feel that it, it's almost palpable. And maybe it's just the excitement around Patra and Beecher and stuff like that. Maybe that's just it. But I do feel like it's been palpable over the last week or two that there's some hope about this Bees team. And I, th I think many of us look at this as a quote-unquote bridge year. But over the last week or two, it might be a fun bridge year. It, it might end up being a bridge year that exceeds expectations. This is a team that's going to, you know, we always, we've been talking about this the last few months. This is a team that's going to depend on its blue line and its goaltending. First and foremost, don't get it twisted. Blue line goaltending, very deep on the blue line. Very, very deep at that goaltending spot, right? So they're going to lean on the blue line and the goaltending and hope they can get enough offense and hope that their rookie centers don't lose their minds and can somehow solidify the third and fourth lines. If that center spot survives, if Patra and Beecher are the answer, or if they're not the answer and you find another answer, if you can somehow cobble that thing together, this team still has talent. This team still has a good amount of talent. So I just feel like there's some hope. And there was uh, the athletic projections late last week that I caught up on. And Dom L, I'm not even going to try, attempt to pronounce his last name. It's impossible. Dom L at the Athletic. The Bruins projection was 103.4 as far as points go. And the feeling was that, you know, 80% of the people felt that that was too high. But here's what Dom wrote in the Athletic. Again, Dom L. Wish he had the last name Smith. 
Team's very weak down the middle. Lack of support, key position. Likely have a cascading effect that reverberates throughout the lineup in a way the model doesn't quite anticipate. He says that's how people feel about this team, even though the athletic model projects 103 points. Here's what Dom L wrote. While I agree Boston should be lower, I don't believe this team is toast. Still an elite core. Still a very deep blue line. An incredible goaltending duo. And this is still a team that set an NHL record last year, a year in which the model was a believer amid a room full of skeptics expecting the team to miss the playoffs entirely. There's a balance to be struck here. It's in recognizing that everything that could go right last year did and understanding that likely won't happen again, especially with so many players gone. But at the same time, it's also recognizing that the Bruins started from a very high place before accounting for regression. Again, Krejci, Bergey, Hall, and a change in personnel. There's only so many points that can be shaved off in that regard. Dom L and the Athletic finishes, maybe it doesn't mean a 103-point team, but this should still be a playoff team on very solid ground. Again, bridge year. If it's if you have a bridge year that ends up being a playoff team with some young guys developing and, and getting us excited, I'll take that every single day of the week and twice on Sunday, especially Sunday since Patriots are making my Sundays miserable. Sign me up. So Bruins start tonight should be fun. Again, don't forget, Apple Pods, Spotify, YouTube, check us out. Give us that thumbs up. Give us those comments. I think the Bruins are going to make the playoffs. I think they will be there. I actually have some positive vibes about them right now. Maybe I'll look like an idiot down the road. But I'm somewhat optimistic about this team. More optimistic now than I was two, three months ago. Uh, we'll t catch you tomorrow. Obviously, more talk about the Patriots. Uh, maybe try to get into some of the, the Raiders matchups and stuff. Also. We'll react to what happens tonight with the Bs, and the Cs also play a preseason game as well. Until then, be well. It's the Nick Cattle Show.